Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, my personal silly little corner of the internet that I use to compare films to the books they're based on. Today's subject of review is probably one of the most consistently requested adaptations in the life of my channel. In the time between when I officially added it to the to-do list and now, it actually got adapted again into a TV show, which should give you some idea of my level of efficiency at my job. Anyway. The Northern Lights, published in 1995, was written by English author and Oxford University teacher Philip Pullman. It's the first of a trilogy of books known as His Dark Materials. When it was distributed in America, the book was retitled The Golden Compass for really stupid reasons that I'll fill you in on later. If you're not acquainted with this series, don't let the cute looking girl and floofy bear on the cover fool you. Despite being a beloved fantasy book and very popular with young readers, in my opinion they more than earned the dark part of their title. Said title is further proof that this Pullman gentleman was not playing around, as it's a quote from Paradise Lost by John Milton. You know, that delightful little epic poem about Satan. All episodes of Lost in Adaptation are pretty spoiler heavy because, you know, I can't really discuss the differences between plots without describing said plots, but I wanted to make an extra effort to highlight this one in particular. If you've not read these books and think you might in the future, the experience will be greater not knowing what I'm about to reveal. I also want to mention that much like in the 1967 adaptation of The Hobbit that I recently talked about, there's a bit of behind the scenes drama involved in this film's creation, so please stick with me until the end to find out the why as well as the what regarding what was lost in the adaptation process. Alright then, uh, the the story takes place on Earth, but in an alternate universe, similar in some ways to ours, but very different in others. While the setting was technically contemporary to the 1990s of the book's release, the technology involved seems to be closer to the 1940s, as travel primarily consists of steamboats and zeppelins. While countries seem to exist mostly in keeping with our world, most of them are under the rule of a Catholic adjacent theocracy with seemingly limitless power. The most interesting difference, however, is the existence of demons, um, not spelled the way you might be thinking. Simplified, a demon appears to be a part of someone's soul that exists autonomously with its own personality. They take the form of animals but can talk like humans. A demon can shapeshift between different animal forms until their human hits puberty, then they will permanently settle into one that best reflects their personality. A group of people known as the Egyptians feature heavily in the story. They're pretty clearly allegorical to Romanian travellers, though I'm sure glad Pullman came up with his own word for them, therefore sidestepping his book aging badly when people realized the real world counterpart was problematic. And finally, there's an island called Svalbard populated by the Armored Bears, a sapient race of polar bears highly skilled in warfare and mechanical engineering. They wear almost indestructible armor that they forge out of meteorite metal, solve their issues with ceremonial combat, and are traditionally hostile and isolationist towards the rest of the world. The novel is split into three parts which form an overall story, but also each contain at least a vague three-act structure. The story centers around a young girl called Lyra and her demon Pantalaimon. Due to circumstances involving her lineage, a prophecy, and a ton of attitude, she finds herself wrapped up in a terrible conspiracy involving the mass kidnapping and mutilation of children her age. She does her best to save the day, but gosh damn things get rough for the poor thing. BT dubs none of the information I just summarized was delivered in the form of exposition in the book. Pullman allowed for all of it to be revealed via context throughout the story. It's a fucking ballsy writer move as it comes with a serious danger of confusing the reader. I personally think he walked the line really well, but I know this sort of world building isn't for everyone, even if it's done well. Pullman is considered the philosophical inverse of C.S. Lewis. The Chronicles of Narnia exalt the virtues of young innocence and the embrace of Jesus' persona. His Dark Materials focuses on the harsh realities of an unfair world and is deeply suspicious of organized religion. Just from a objective historical standpoint, I would say that Pullman has the far more accurate take on the subject, but that's not always what you want from your fantasy, so I'd say neither theme is inherently better. Now, you would think that Pullman's absolute theocracy is bad actually, hot take would be fairly uncontroversial, but as I've discovered time and time again while studying adaptations, the excessively religious have absolutely no chill, so many devout organizations took vocal issue with his books. It's a tad worrying that the Catholic Church saw enough of themselves in the corrupted, amoral monsters using their faith as a veil to hide their power hunger to be offended by their existence in a book, the bishop doth protest too much, methinks. 
The film adaptation we're looking at today premiered in December 2007. It was written and directed by a Mr. Chris Wright, who appears to be one of those Hollywood everymans, having credits in producing, writing, directing, and, because he occasionally cameos in his own movies, acting. You may know him from American Pie or Twilight New Moon. Oh god, Twilight is following me, it won't let me leave. The cast is pretty spectacular. Nicole Kidman, Ian McKellen, Daniel Craig, Sam Elliott, Eva Green, Ian McShane, Kathy Bates, Kristen Scott, Thomas, Christopher Lee, and Derek Jacobi all being in a movie together is a little mind-blowing. They also clearly threw a ton of money behind making sure the fantasy environments looked as realistic as possible with the CG available at the time. The colossal potential all this implies makes it even harder to report that this film is super underwhelming. A good deal of the problem stems from the lead, Dakota Blue Richards. While she would go on to star in shows like Skins, she had absolutely zero acting experience before this role and it shows. Her flat, borderline monotone performance drags every scene down. Lyra. I am certain, however, that this was not entirely her fault. Several demonstrably talented actors gave super wooden, charismaless performances, so there's almost certainly an element of poor directing involved too. The problem is exacerbated no end by the worst ADR I have ever witnessed in a high-budget film. Who are you? My name is Serafina Pekela, clan queen of the witches of Lake Inara. A witch? Where's your demon? I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Sound design in general is pretty underwhelming. You definitely don't get a good sense for the deadly weather of the north from the barely perceptible light wind stock sound effect they slapped on top of it. I will say some of the exceptional cast like Kidman and McKellen managed to salvage something from the direction they were given, and Sam Elliott seems to be genuinely having a good time, which was a serious saving grace for the film. All in all, just judging it as a film and not an adaptation, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's nowhere near as good as all the talent involved should have made it. Now, let's judge it as an adaptation, shall we? The world is basically the same as the book with its steampunkish technology and theocratic government. Twelve-year-old Lyra, a supposed orphan, lives at a prestigious university in Oxford, England. Her demon, still young enough to shapeshift, is called Pantalaimon, or Pan for short. She and her best friend Roger have an ongoing rivalry with the children of the Egyptian sailors who often visit the city, which is almost all performative and actually based on friendship. Due to her precocious nature, she sneaks into a private meeting room and happens to see the master of the college poisoning a bottle of wine intended for her uncle, Lord Azriel, the famous explorer. After she tips him off, he sends her back into the closet and she overhears his lecture about a substance he's discovered called dust, a seemingly magical, usually invisible substance that constantly rains from the sky and seems to be interacting with adult humans in some way. Lord Azriel believes the dust is a bridge to infinite alternate realities and dimensions, one of which can apparently sometimes be seen in the Aurora Borealis, the North than lights, taking the form of a grand city. Asriel is able to convince these scholars to fund further explorations of dust, which will require him to travel to the northmost islands of the globe. His great expedition is short-lived, however, as he's immediately captured by hostile forces. Back in England, rumours spread all over the city of a terrifying group of people who have been kidnapping children, never to be seen again. They gain the nickname the Gobblers, and alas, they apprehend Roger and his Egyptian friend Billy. Initially desperate to go looking for him, Lyra is distracted from this quest when she's introduced to a woman named Mrs. Coulter, who charms her into extreme hero worship and who offers to become her guardian and take her away to London. The master of the college seems deeply unhappy about this, but for some reason is incapable of stopping it. Before Lyra leaves Oxford, he gives her an alethiometer, an extremely rare magical item that looks a little bit like a golden compass. Lyra thinks it's very cool, but has no idea how to use it. At first, Lyra enjoys her time with Coulter, but the woman's sunny exterior quickly slips to reveal a cruel, controlling, and casually violent personality underneath. To make matters worse, Lyra discovers that her new caretaker is involved with a government-sanctioned organization called the General Oblation Board, aka the GOB. 
aka the Gobblers, and realizes she's taking the missing children away to be experimented on in a secret lab in the far off north. Coulter's demon, a golden monkey, snoops through Lyra's stuff and discovers the alethiometer, but fortunately she and Pan escape before Coulter can take possession of it. She doesn't last too long on the streets because everyone and their mum is apparently keen to kidnap children in this town, but she's rescued by the Costas, her Egyptian friends who have apparently taken heavy losses to the Gobblers, so are actively fighting back against them. Through the Costas, Lyra meets John Farr, the leader of the Egyptians, and they form a strike force to attack the secret lab and liberate all the captured children. With help from a wise old Egyptian named Father Corum, Lyra realizes that she can read messages in the alethiometer, and it's a deus ex machina device that can answer literally any question put to it regarding the past, present, or even future. The team tries to enlist the help of Yurik Bernison, a bear living in exile from Svalbard, but he's busy drowning his sorrows in booze because the town authorities have stolen his armor and are hiding it from him. A bear's armor is so integrated into their sense of identity, they can't really function without it. Using her convenient magic solval device, Lyra tells him where it's hidden and he recovers it using extreme force. The police understandably aren't too keen on this, but the timely intervention of another recruit, a Texan aeronaut named Lee Scoresby, stops matters from escalating too far and Yurik swears fealty to the quest in gratitude. He's later revealed to be the true heir to the bear throne because of course he is, that's kind of just what happens in fantasy. An ancient witch called Serafina Pecola, a former lover of Father Corum, makes contact and non-committally suggests that she might be willing to help out with the quest. The ship they're sailing on is attacked partway through their journey to the north by two insect-like drones sent by Coulter that are part magical and part mechanical. They manage to capture one and seal it in a tin. When they finally arrive, Lyra gets another hint from her infinite cheat book and talks Yurik into letting her ride him to an isolated house containing one one of the children who escaped from the facility after being experimented on. To her horror, she discovers that they're intentionally severing the children's links to their demons, an act equivalent to mutilation and invasive lobotomy, as it leaves them as a short-lived husk of a person afterwards. Despite all their best efforts to be prepared, the Egyptian raiding party are surprise attacked and Lyra is captured. This is where things start to get a little wonky adaptation-wise, especially regarding the order that events take place. That said, at least the events themselves are reasonably book accurate for the most part. Lyra is eventually brought before the usurper king of the bears and, thinking very quickly, remembers some useful trivia she learned about him. Namely, that he is a total simp for humans and really wants a demon of his own. So, she convinces him that she is a demon and she belongs to his old rival Yurik who has found a way for bears to... I don't know, grow one or something. She pretends she's not so keen on her current master, so is here to reveal to the king that if he kills Yurik in one-on-one -on -one combat instead of just having his guards shoot him when he turns up, she'll transfer to him instead. Apparently, she rolled a nat 20 on her deception check, so when Yurik comes charging into the rescue, the king comes out to meet him mano a mano. Berano, Berano. Lyra feels bad that she manipulated her friend into having to fight to the death, but Yurik is all about this jazz as he has a score to settle. The battle is intense, but Yurik is victorious when he tears his opponent's jaw right off his face. Well, I'm legit surprised they stuck to that. Lyra eventually finds the facility she's looking for and is taken in as an intended victim, reuniting with Roger. Coulter shows up and Lyra spies on a meeting between her and her underlings, learning all the nasty details about how these scientists cut demons from children. She's discovered and almost suffers this terrible fate herself, but is saved at the last second by Coulter, who is revealed to be Lyra's mother as Lord Azrael was her extramarital lover and Lyra's father. Coulter is super keen on taking the Alethea from Lyra, but the sneaky lass switched out the device with the tin containing the murder bug and her errant mum gets knocked the fuck out when she opens it. Lyra leads a jailbreak and the army protecting the facility is brought down by the remaining Egyptians and Serafina's clan of witches. Lyra escapes with Roger, Yurik and Serafina on Lee's balloon and they fly off to rescue her uncle, dad. I did appreciate some adherence to the finer details that could easily have been ignored. For example, Lyra's weird habit of always calling people by their full first and second names every time she speaks to them. However, this concludes the positive things I have to say about this adaptation. Okay, so... 
I don't know about anyone else, but I think it was pretty obvious that most of the changes intentionally made to the film seemed intent on two purposes. Firstly, to make the story less dark, and secondly, to make the story more like the Lord of the Rings. Yep, it's yet another fantasy adaptation living in the shadow of those game-changing movies. I'm guessing New Line Cinema were finally catching on that they couldn't milk them for much longer and wanted something new, but also basically the same to compete with Harry Potter. Just as an example, one of the most prominent changes a fan of the book will notice in the film is the switching around of the plots of part two and three. Originally, Lyra helped liberate the children from the Gobbler base, then flew to Svalbard to ad-lib a violent change in leadership. And what do you know, this just happened to put the largest scale battle of the book right at the end of the story. Witches. Witches. They're coming. To accommodate this switch, they had to figure out how to get Lyra to the King of the Bears right after her kidnapping, and their solution was to have the raiders working directly for him, though they kind of failed to provide a reason why he would want them to bring every passing child before him. The raiders presence on Svalbard kind of flies in the face of the whole bears only island thing, but I don't know, I guess the usurper king is a human fanboy, so maybe he invited them. While we're on the subject of the bears, I was mildly annoyed by their species name being changed from the armored bears to the ice bears in the film. I guess because they didn't trust us to know what a polar bear is without some reference to cold. It takes a bit of the impact out of Yurik's what is an armoured bear without his armour themed identity crisis, but hey, at least it added… nothing. The Bear King's name goes from… uh… Eufer Ragnarsson to Ragnar Sturluson. As you can see, they're equally impossible for me to pronounce, so I'm not entirely sure what this was in aid of. The event switcheroo has another hilarious side effect. Instead of Lyra arriving at the child murder base when she's brought there to be sold by the raiders who captured her, she just kind of wanders up to the door, and I kid you not, the staff don't bat an eyelash. Oh yes, nothing suspicious about a small child walking up out of nowhere to your utterly isolated hidden base. Wouldn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, now would we? One change that really should have helped the film have more impact was combining Tony, the poor random kid who had his demon cut away, with Billy Costa. A character that Lyra has a personal connection with, suffering a fate worse than death, has more obvious gut-wrenching potential. However, the film neuters this emotional impact completely by including his mother loudly reassuring him that they would find a way to find and restore his demon to him, giving the situation a ray of hope and optimism. That is not ever ever considered as a possibility in the book. That poor kid died clutching a scrap of fish meat to him in the heart-wrenching agony of loss. For once, a film's failure to be engaging on a cinematic and acting level really affected it as an adaptation as well, because this book is engaging as fuck. The before-mentioned monotone bland performances from half the cast sucked all of the tension and emotion out of what were originally very suspenseful or moving scenes. This is worsened by the film never really giving us time to get to know any of the cast and build up any affection for them, so their peril and suffering leaves one quite unmoved. Now, to be fair, this is a pretty dense book regarding essential plot beats and character moments like that. It takes place in a dozen different locations and constantly introduces a ton of new characters, so I for sure have sympathy for the guys who had to try to budget the film's runtime to cover enough of it, but that doesn't make their miserable failure to do so any less detrimental to the adaptation. In the book, the Egyptians fill Lyra in on her true lineage to make sure she's emotionally ready for what's ahead. The film has Coulter drop it on her like a gender-flipped Empire Strikes Back power. It's implied that Coulter and her demon grab children by violent force in the film. It's actually way more creepy in the original setup, where she charms the kids so skillfully they willingly leave with her with smiles on their faces. The effect of her wonderful, friendly, caring personality is so chilling when you know she's using it to take children away from mutilation. The Magisterium, the before-mentioned ruling theocracy, are left as a nebulous off-screen menace in this particular book. The film cast actors 
was to give them a face and, therefore, a more direct sinister presence, though as one of those faces was Christopher Lee's, I am not going to complain about that. From a world-building perspective, the filmmakers chose the exact opposite path to the author, dumping more exposition in the first 30 seconds than the entire trilogy of Pullman's books combined. The alethiometer was drafted into becoming an additional exposition dumper as well, and to be fair, that's not out of keeping with its original purpose, but they are way less subtle about it. And finally, in the book, the alethiometer is not officially called a golden compass. It was just briefly described as looking a bit like one. The film made it its official second name and went out of its way to say it as much as possible. What is this? An alethiometer, also known as a golden compass. We have a title! Yes. We have a title! Oh, you want to know what they left out? I'll tell you what they mother-loving left out. They left out the end of the God's Damn Book. The film just stops as they're heading towards what should have been the super dark climax to the story. Strap in, y'all, because it's a doozy. Keep in mind that Uncle Daddy Lord Daniel Craig Azrael was being held by the Armoured Bears originally, so after Yurik claims the throne, it's easy enough for Lyra to finally go and talk to him. Azrael is shocked and horrified to see her until he sees that her friend Roger came with her for emotional support, which immediately chills him out. No joke, I saw exactly where this was going the second it was brought up, and I think I actually started hyperventilating while reading. He seems to be utterly incapable of giving a shit when Lyra confronts him about being her real father and tells him all about the trials and tribulations that she's gone through trying to get to him. He gives her a quick lecture on his theory regarding dust and the city that they can see in the Northern Lights, suggesting it ties into the biblical story of original sin and concluding that he might have discovered a way to create a bridge between their world and that one. Lyra has done some serious growing up over her ordeals, so satisfyingly she calls her dad out for being an unloving piss stain. Alas, she is still a child, so he still exerts a huge amount of control over her in the way, regrettably, many real-life abusive family members can. And just when you thought this guy couldn't get any worse, the next day while Lyra is sleeping, he kidnaps Roger, and she realizes an essential part of his bridge-making process must involve cutting a demon away from their child, which explains why Coulter was experimenting with it. The son of a bitch plans to perform this unspeakably cruel deed on Roger. Lyra, Yurik, and a squad of armored bears give chase, but just as they're catching up, a witch clan allied with Azrael ambush them, raining arrows down on them from above as they zip around overhead on their brooms. Then Coulter turns up in a huge machine gun armed airship, and a manic three-way battle is unleashed. King Yurik tries to take her on ahead, but this was the original context for the ice bridge that was barely strong enough for her, let alone him, which makes way more sense than its use in the movie, where it was the way to the secret base, and Yurik takes her there, encourages her across it, then appears to pull a 180 on the plan and shouts for her to wait for backup before going ahead. Anyways, they're separated and Lyra has to try to stop her father from completing the operation to sever Roger from his demon solo. Again, things get excessively complicated when her mother turns up with her golden monkey demon and there's another three-way fight. In a twist so wrenching I wasn't sure my poor heart could take it, Lyra comes within inches of rescuing Roger, but Lord Douchebag completes his task and the poor boy is magically lobotomized, opening up a beam of light looking bridge thing, presumably to the Northern Lights world. Faced with this dazzling display, Coulter and Azrael stop fighting and he declares this discovery will mark the doom for the Magisterium before making out with her and suggesting they go and explore this new world together. Coulter feels that her place is in this world, so Azrael instantly turns his back on her and proceeds to the magical bridge alone, leaving her sobbing in misery. Wow, you have to be such a bastard to come off as worse than the woman who murders children for a living. Deep in shock over Roger's loss, Lyra and Pan decide that their best bet is to follow her deadbeat dad into this new world and try to fuck up whatever plans he has for messing with dust and people's connections to their demons. And that is the very depressing note that the book ends on. The emotional weight of Lyra being betrayed by both her parents, especially the father she had come to hero worship, cannot be overstated, and it was a huge part of what made the book memorable. It's really hard to imagine a worse part of the plot to drop completely with no explanation. Azrael is such a nothing character in the film. Even though he's not directly in the plot, there's a ton of interesting things related to him that come up in the book, like his backstory killing Coulter's husband in a duel and losing his estate because of it, and I don't know, the fucking human head he brought with him to the meeting in the college? Okay, so, 
Before I move on to the final thoughts, I promised y'all some behind the scenes drama and your Uncle Dom is going to deliver. Let's start with the evolution of the title and how it ties into the alethiometer. TLDR, it doesn't, and it's bloody stupid. As previously mentioned, the book was originally titled The Northern Lights. In the beginning, Pullman was considering calling the series as a whole His Golden Compasses, which is also a quote from Paradise Lost. However, it refers to this kind of compass, not the round, magnetic direction finding kind. Apparently, the American editors got them mixed up and thought the name was a reference to the alethiometer. Subsequently, they started referring to the book as the Golden Compass around the office. According to Pullman, they got so attached to the name, they demanded the book be titled as such for the US release, and Pullman, who seems to be a pretty chill dude, just kind of went with it. So yeah, kind of makes it doubly stupid that they kept calling it a golden compass in the film, huh? Next came the pre-production drama. New Line Cinema purchased the film rights in February 2002. Originally, the screenplay was going to be written by Tom Stoppard, who, as a respected writer, seemed like a solid choice for adapting a fantasy book. However, when Whites took the director's spot in July 2003, he kind of claimed the writing for himself as well, and Stoppard ended up getting ghosted by the studio. During an interview for Time magazine in December 2004, Wright made the rather poor decision to hint that they were planning on toning down the anti-religious aspects of the book, which elicited a predictable enraged reaction from fans. Wright quit the project less than a week later. He was briefly replaced by British director Anar Tucker in August 2005, but he only lasted eight months before noping out of there as well, and New Line somehow dragged Wright back on board. The first draft of Wright's script is available online, and I gotta say, it's pretty fucking close to the book. Like, it really seems like Wright's copy pasted huge chunks of it into a screenplay format. He even wrote and filmed Roger's Terrible Fate and The Gateway opening up to the other world. You can see what's left of it on YouTube, some industrious person has recreated it using deleted scenes, original storyboards, and still images. So what happened? Well, studio interference fucking happened, of course. They wanted another cash cow and they didn't care how much of the book they had to shred to get it. Trust me, this is not the first or last time the blindingly obvious counterproductive nature of that sort of interference was completely lost on them. While directing New Moon a few years later, White stated that it was super refreshing to work on something where he was given a little space and allowed to stick to the book he was adapting. Think about that. The production on the Golden Compass was so stressful, this dude greatly preferred working on Twilight. And on top of all of that, the religious nuts got all up in a tizzy again. The Catholic League for Religious Civil Rights, um, not to be confused with the Catholic Legion of Decency that objected to the Village of the Damned in the 60s, started an aggressive boycott campaign, claiming that Pullman's work was atheist propaganda. Once again, completely missing that the books are clearly not anti-God, they're anti-theocracy. Spoiler for the last book, but if anyone tells you that this is a series about killing God, that is not strictly true. It's a series about killing someone who was pretending to be a god, so it's no more or less militantly atheist than the plot of Stargate. The film still didn't do poorly by any stretch, but it didn't pull in the kind of money that New Line wanted, so combined with the drama of production, the intended sequels were axed before they were even begun. Very amusingly, Sam Elliott was not subtle in his opinion that uptight religious conservatives killed these subsequent movies and ruined all of his fun. Apparently, he was really enjoying playing himself in a fantasy series. Final thoughts. All in all, it's a pretty disappointing adaptation. Lost themes, mixed messages, characters rendered completely unrelatable through terrible performances, but God's Damn, when you consider that it's a product of an already pretty mediocre director, beset from three sides, fans of the book howling for his blood for every change, religious conservatives demanding changes be made, and a studio that wanted him to make a completely different film entirely in order to make a ton of money, it's actually kind of amazing it wasn't much, much worse. It's not so bad that I would be surprised to hear that you enjoyed it, and feel free to tell me if you did and why in the comments, but for me personally, it's a hard swing and a miss. Either way, I am certain that Wright super regretted taking full control of writing and directing this bad boy. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget that the dark force of the YouTube algorithm still yearns for the blood of middling channels like mine, so any engagement you can throw my way in the form of likes, comments, and shares on Twitter will go a long way towards shielding me from it. If it strikes your fancy, do check out my Patreon page for exclusive content, access to my Discord server, and the chance to make requests for future episodes. Oh, and if you're open to suggestions about what to watch next, my co-writer for this episode posted an in-depth retrospective about Xena Warrior Princess last week. If you're a fan of the show or would like to learn a little more about it, do check it out. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I hope to see you next time. A child.
shield and demon flee the magisterium Helped by a cowboy who sails on the air Far to the north, away from evil forces They'll place their trust in the one waiting there Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honour, Shelby Holt, Sotel Spurtloff, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Il Nej for performing this awesome tune, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. She does some really amazing work on her channel that I think you would really enjoy, so be sure to check that out too. A demon from their child, from a child. A child's demon from them. Shut up, printer. Yeah, now speaking to my printer probably isn't my greatest sign of sanity, let alone him, which wakes well. Philip Pullman, a writer of the normal Northern Lights. This is very bad French accent.